everyone. Uh, tonight we have our student representative who will lead, lead us in the pledge, and that is Korea Rankin. May everyone please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Korea. We are meeting remotely tonight and welcome all those who are participating by watching through YouTube. As a reminder, we welcome public comment and have provided a mechanism for you to make public comment by leaving voice messages to be played to the board and the public during our broadcast. If you wish to speak at a future meeting, please go to our public participation page on www.lbschools.net, which will give you more information about how to give public comment. As a reminder, in conformance with the Brown Act, when we hear testimony on an item that is not listed on the agenda, a full discussion of that topic would have to be delayed until such a time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. In closed session today, the board voted to approve the dismissal of employee number 00120618. A certificated teacher. The vote was unanimous with all five members of the board voting to approve in a roll call vote. Okay, next we have, well, public hearing, we have none. Uh, call for agenda items for separate action and adoption of the agenda as posted. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor by a roll call vote. Uh, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. And I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5 0. Um, approval of minutes. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor by roll call vote, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. And I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5 0. Madam Chair, very quickly, we still have our student rep here. Um, normally, we uh, Ask a few questions and let her get her homework done. I'm glad you asked. I have it as a note to myself. Good. This is the time that I will make a formal introduction of our student representative and for future agendas, it will be listed. All right. At this time, I'd like to uh, thank our student rep, uh, Korea Rankin, for being with us this evening. Um, if you don't mind, we would like to hear from you at this point in the meeting. Give us your report. I feel as though that will start off the meeting on the right note, and then we can ask you some questions. So, uh, Korea, we're all here. Good evening, President Craighead, distinguished board members, Superintendent Dr. Baker, executive staff, and community. Greetings and salutations. My name is Korea Rankin, also known as Korea Mia Moore, and I'm a junior at Cabrillo High School, and in fact, their student body president. I'd like to start this off by giving a warm welcome to our new principal, Dr. Poffenberger, as well as congratulating Dr. Fulton Williams and Mr. John Meyer on their retirements. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your leadership and thank Dr. Williams specifically for his participation in the many graduation ceremonies over the course of his tenure with our Board of Education. I'd also like to personally thank our board members and executive staff for having me here to share with you all about the, what a wondrous impact Cabrillo High School staff and environment has had on us all. As you know, there has of course been a major change within the environment of school due to the ongoing pandemic. Students have lost motivation and as many may say, their second home. I am, fact, I am in fact one of the students who once felt this way. I completely felt lost. 
like I was going down a deep dark hole which only got deeper and dimmer the farther we got into the year. I completely felt lost. And this is coming from the student body president, a student leader. So if I was so lost at the start, imagine the students who do not already have a path and goal set for them. I was able to find the light with the help of Cabrillo staff and of course my family. I would love to shine a light upon some of our staff who support so many of our students. Mrs. Smarlin, Ms. Granary, our ASB director, one of our English teachers, Ms. Montu, one of our law teachers, Mr. Newman, our visual and digital arts department lead, Ms. Godfrey, and our vice principal, Mrs. Alexander. I am not have felt this motivated and important without them showing you that this is our story. It only gets better from here. There are just a few of the caring and empowering staff we have at Cabrillo High School. Cabrillo isn't just a school to many. We are all a family. So much of a family that even though our campus is enormous, we can easily spot a new face that is in need to be welcomed. Though, now that the experience is virtual, we have yet to question if these new fellow Cabrillo students feel like they can call their school their second home. That is a topic ASB has been trying to figure out. And by doing so, we have organized multiple virtual activities, which allow students to still be engaged without being on campus. Our ASB Instagram page highlights the lovely photos of student participants, which allows the students who are following the page to meet new Cabrillo students and gain associates. Regardless of this pandemic, we're continuing to keep up the school spirit with safety precautions. We are making sure we lift our voices and social platforms to build a wider community, even outside of Cabrillo. Even with virtual learning, our school is also focused on increasing the number of students who meet A through G requirements. Our teachers, counselors, and administrators wanna make sure that all Cabrillo students are college and career ready and have a choice of attending a two-year or four-year university. We have outstanding students who are making sure this time away from campus is used positively to build a reputation and future. For example, my fellow ASB JAG, Joy Wallace, and I, the two out of the three finalists for this year's 2021 Youth of the Year Award with the Boys and Girls Club of Long Beach. In fact, I won a scholarship competition this year and Joy had won the same scholarship last year. This allowed Cabrillo's name to be represented in the press telegram, not just once, but twice. We are proud to represent Cabrillo's student body and even more proud to give back to a school that has given us so much. We are definitely a school that is on a mission to build our image. I know a lot of people look at our sports and the neighborhoods surrounding our school and allow that opinion to dictate the quality of the school. That is wrong, and we are determined to prove that. Once again, thank you for having me here to share with you about the wondrous impact Cabrillo's high school staff and climate has had on us all. We truly are the success in the West. Thank you. Thank you, Korea. Um, I appreciate your honesty with us and I appreciate you letting us know that you've had a hard time with this online instruction. And can you share what kind of coping skills you've developed or what has helped you when, when you're feeling down? So honestly, I am very active into school. Like I've been in plays, I've been in the dance performances and like a lot of things on campus. So since I'm heavily active, once like the whole March 12th, I believe, we left campus, it was like really, really hard. And I was very depressed. I'm not even going to lie to you guys. And so with that being said, at the beginning, I was more to myself. I wasn't focused on school at all. Like, yes, not at all. So with that, um, I had a lot of teachers that recognized that and they reached out to me. So that was one of the things that really put me into school again and like made me want to run for president, et cetera, because I just felt that love and that care at Cabrillo High School. Like our teachers deeply, deeply care about us. And I know a lot of people probably can't say that. So I would just say the comforting and the welcoming um, of teachers reaching out to us and letting us know that they're there for us, it really helps me. Thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing. That is a wonderful shout out to our teachers and a, a great testament to Cabrillo High School. And I can tell you, you are so proud. Do we have other questions? I think um, Dr. Williams, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, well, I'm very proud of uh, this young lady and uh, what she's been able to accomplish. Uh, just wish you all the success going forward. Very proud of uh, the school. Uh, it's uh, a standard for me with the, uh, the, just the amount of energy and effort we've put into Cabrillo. 
quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I really admire that T-shirt that she has on. I'd like to get one of those. Uh, <laughs> I wonder, wonder where I can acquire one of those, Korea. Uh, very nice. Thank you. So we actually have a Cabrillo High School on our Cabrillo High School website. There's a link to our ASB website, which is a different separate website. And we have all of our clothing and it's just a whole bunch of Jaguar and et cetera for our spirit wear. So you will find it on the Cabrillo High School page. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Thank you. And we understand that you may be busy with schoolwork so we're not going to insist that you stay the whole entire meeting. If you need to go and take care of whatever you need to take care of, we understand. Although you are welcome to spend the whole entire board meeting with us. <laughs> Thanks again for being here. Thank um, you. Okay, next on the agenda, um, we have commun well communications, but we have none. Uh, public testimony on items listed on the agenda um, we don't have any. Okay, so we don't have any and public testimony on items not listed on the agenda. We do have one comment, which will be played right now. Okay, thank you. Cindy Young, item not listed on the agenda for this evening's board meeting. Good evening, President Craighead, members of the board, Superintendent Baker and executive staff. My name is Cindy Young and tonight I represent the Association of Long Beach Education Managers, more commonly referred to as ALBUM. We wanted to formally thank John and Felton for their dedication, commitment and service to the students, staff and families of LBUSD. Their leadership has made a positive impact in our work and ability to serve our families. Each is leaving a legacy that will live on in this district for years to come. Both have maintained a leadership style where they were approachable and eager to support. They are caring, dedicated, and hardworking. They have been role models and have been part of a team that has led and supported our district through some of the most challenging times we have ever faced. Album is grateful for their commitment to excellence and equity, and we wish them well in their retirement and future endeavors. That was very nice. Um, okay, so we have no further um, public comment. So we will go right to staff report. I will hand things over to Jill, uh, Dr. Baker. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to make the introduction of two staff reports tonight. And I'd like to just introduce them by sharing that these were two presentations that were planned for the board workshop that we unfortunately had to cancel. They were planned as we continue to focus on our student progress and to share different aspects of data with you across our student populations. And so you may remember in summer, Chris Brown shared a, a presentation around our African-American student progress. Tonight, he'll be sharing about Latinx student progress in Long Beach Unified School District over time. The second presentation Dr. Len will lead is a, is a um, a look at our K-8 school programs. As we think about the future of Long Beach Unified School District, we're also looking at all of our different programs. And so Dr. Len has done an analysis of K-8 schools and has some information to share with you as we proceed into this year. And so I will first turn over to Chris Brown who will lead us in a Latinx data presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Give me a second to uh, share the presentation with everybody so that we can see it. And hopefully that's showing up on everyone's screen right now. Um, good evening, board members, exec staff, colleagues, of course, our student board member, Ms. Rankin. Um, I'm excited to get back into the data with you like I was able to do in August. Um, and I think this is a perfect venue. It's a nice short little chunk of data because uh, most people aren't as excited about all the numbers as I am as we go through it. Uh, if you recall in August, I shared the pre-COVID sort of long-term look at how African-American students had been faring across a number of metrics in our system. Again, we didn't share every possible metric, uh, but we did pick some, some indicators of later success. And, and we're gonna do the same thing tonight with Latinx students. Um, really in keeping with uh, Superintendent uh, Dr. Baker's equity and excellence agenda, really looking at where our students are, how they're performing and where we can push for excellence amongst all of our student groups. So 
there's a lot of good news and a lot of great work that has been done by our Latinx students since 2011, up until uh, we had to go to remote learning for COVID. During that time, we had a 23% increase in the number of Latinx students taking one or more AP classes. We had an 11% increase in the graduation rate of Latinx students. And we had a 14% increase in the A to G completion rate for Latinx students. And those are all great numbers, but they only tell part of the story. The other part of that is that Latinx students were the fastest growing subgroups in each of those categories, which means not only did they have these great growths, but they closed the gap between their subgroup and other uh, subgroups. So the 23% increase in AP classes is a gap closure of 8%. The grad rate represents a gap closure of 7%. And the increase in A through G is a gap closure of 3%. So, you know, as a district that has Latinx students as our largest subgroup, a lot of the district success and the, the trends in, in student academic output that we've seen moving forward over the last eight years has really been our Latinx students moving um, from an area to, uh, to an area of more academic success. There's also um, been increases in SBAC ELA proficiency rates in grades three and five of 19%, a 16% increase in proficiency rates of grades six through eight. So what that means is that 19% more students are scoring at proficient or higher levels uh, on these tests. Uh, it's been a 23% increase for math in grades three through five and 17 in, in grades six and eight. And, and seeing math increases when historically and nationwide, and especially in the state of California, we do not see math proficiency increases amongst many subgroups of students, uh, really is, is something that, that our students we commend for. They've worked really hard. And, and then the third item I've put here on the slide is really that, that middle school accelerated math. And there's been a 30% increase in the number of, or the, sorry, the proportion of Latinx students enrolled in middle school math, accelerated math. And that's an important thing because middle school accelerated math leads to algebra in eighth grade, which is really a gateway for a uh, higher or should say more rigorous sequence of math in high school and, and a lot of the A through G grad rate and post-secondary options that then open from that. So we like to look at accelerated math in middle school as an indicator of where our students are going to have options for them after they leave high school. And again, all of these things represented gap closures as well. Um, we do have some areas we need to continue focusing on, right? They're just like we do with every group of students and in, in multiple categories. While we have seen a 4% decrease in the proportion of students with a GPA below 2.0, which is a great metric, that's actually been a slower decrease than some of our other subgroups. So we've seen that decrease in all of our students across the system, and it hasn't been as rapid for our, some of our Latinx students. Um, same with the second item here. We've seen a 9% increase in the proportion of, of grade nine students scoring above the 50th percentile on PSAT. And that's really an indicator of middle school. They take that grade nine PSAT in October of their ninth grade year. So it's really showing what they did in sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And that's great. That's a huge increase. But again, system wide, we've seen an increase. And some of our groups have actually increased faster than that or had increases bigger than 9%. So while our Latinx students are improving, we're not closing gaps there like we would like to be doing. <clears throat> and then actually, um, by the time they get to 11th grade, we're actually seeing a, a slight decrease in the proportion of grade 11 students who are scoring above that national 50th percentile rank on the PSAT. So as they spend time in high school, we have a, a, a little bit of work to do to help our Latinx students be more successful. Um, and, and I'll dig into that a little bit more as we move through this presentation. The other thing we often talk about when we look for equity and excellence and, and we start to think about that is we look to see are our groups of students over or underrepresented in certain areas. And one of those areas that we talked about last time in August was special ed. And so um, our his, uh, Latinx students actually make up the um, enrollment of special ed similar to their enrollment in the district. So they're not overrepresented. Uh, and in fact, for emotional disturbance uh, IEPs, our Latinx students are actually underrepresented. There's actually fewer of them than we would have expected in that group um, based on our just district normal trends. So we're not seeing any overrepresentation in special ed of our Latinx students, which is a good thing. And it's something that not a lot of our colleagues in other systems can say, unfortunately. Um, so I'm gonna dive into elementary, middle and high school specifically and, and talk about a few metrics. And really we're gonna talk about attendance and discipline, and then the impacts of attendance and discipline on our students 
outcomes. And, and there's a lot of outcomes in elementary, middle, and high school. And, and it would be impossible to spend an evening talking about every single possible outcome. So we picked a few. Um, for elementary school, we looked at placement in Math 6 Accelerated. And I'm going to apologize to my colleague, Mr. Moskovitz. I know there are many more outcomes for elementary school we could look at. This was just uh, so that we could compare across our subgroups as we looked uh, at the system. And then for middle school, we're going to look at high school readiness. And then for high school, we're going to really dive into graduation rates and A through G completion rates. So when you look at the overall attendance bands uh, for TK through grade five, there's really not a difference between our Latinx students and our non-Latinx students. So their, their attendance rates are very similar with, within um, sort of acceptable limits in terms of, of statistical significance of, of everyone else. So, so they're attending school at the same rate as everyone else, which is good because as we remember from August, um, sometimes attendance walk can have an impact on things if certain groups are not attending as much or are more likely to be at risk of poor attendance, then it's a uh, sort of a compounding impact on success. And so when we look at grade six placement, or sorry, grade six math six, sorry, placement, we notice that there is a gap between Latinx students, non-Latinx students in almost every area, but we notice that the gap is much larger for students who are severely chronic. For our students who have severely chronic attendance, 45% of non-Latinx students still end up in Math 6 Accelerated, but only 15% of Latinx students with severely chronic attendance end up in Math 6 Accelerated. So what it shows you is that while there's a gap everywhere we need to work on, there's really some work that we could be doing with interventions for our severely chronic kids to find out why are they more impacted in Math 6 Accelerated than their peers who are non-Latinx. And so it gives us a little place to start asking some questions to maybe design some interventions. Uh, when you look at suspensions, uh, actually, much like we saw with our African American subgroup, while suspensions are negatively correlated to math six accelerated replacement, it's not necessarily more pronounced for our Latinx students. In fact, um, students with no suspensions is where you see the gap between non-Latinx and Latinx students. Once we have a suspension, it's detrimental to all students placement in, in math six accelerated. So this is something we definitely are, are cognizant of and definitely working on with our, with our sites to help our students. Um, but it's not more likely to end up that way. And one of the things that, that I thought was interesting when I went through this data, and I didn't produce a slide for it, but Latinx students are actually slightly less likely to be suspended than non-Latinx students in every single one of our levels. So while suspensions hurt everybody, proportionally our Latinx students are less likely to be suspended. So we're not getting that compounded impact of like we are in some other subgroups where suspensions impact them negatively and they're more likely to be suspended, right? In this case, they're actually less likely to be suspended. Um, so suspensions are still bad for their, for their, um, for everybody's math six accelerated replacement, but they're not overemphasized on the Latinx subgroup because they're less likely to be suspended. When we look at middle school, again, we see that there's not a huge difference in the attendance rates for our Latinx students versus our non-Latinx students, which is again, a very positive piece of data. That's something that's good. We don't wanna see big disparities in attendance rates across subgroups. So that's something that we, we like and take uh, heart in. And then we look at high school readiness based on attendance, you'll see that um, as attendance goes down, high school readiness goes down for every subgroup. Um, there is a gap um, and it actually seems to be the largest for kids who have satisfactory attendance. So, so not, not kids who are attending 98 to 99% of the time, but the kids who are attending more than 90% of the time, um, that's where the gap is biggest. Uh, for our middle school students. So that gives us again an, another place to start to dig in and go, okay, so these are students who are coming to school the vast majority of time, maybe not you know, perfectly as we would like, but they're coming to school and we're having this big gap. And in fact, unlike what we saw for Math 6 Accelerated, once you get to severely chronic, uh, the actual impact on Latinx students is less than it is on everyone else. So they actually are more likely to be high school ready even when severely chronic compared to every other subgroup. So again, we always have these ideas that we think we know, oh, if a kid is poorly attending or has suspensions, here's how it's gonna impact them. But we now see that when we break it out a little more for this particular subgroup, it's not a perfect correlation, right? And so there's some work that we've done on, on 
you know, subsets of our Latinx groups who have satisfactory attendance in our schools. And, and I would actually even encourage and something I'm going to help sites with is this might look different by site as well. So this is our district average, but at any one site, you might see a slightly different pattern, which would then help them really respond to the kids they have at their site um, and what they need. Um, when we talk about suspensions, uh, we see a more traditional pattern. Uh, again, Latinx students were slightly less likely to be suspended in middle school than their peers. Uh, and suspensions are detrimental to everyone, but you actually see that the, the gap stays about the same. It stays about nine to 10% based on no suspensions, one suspension, two suspensions, which really what that tells us is that suspensions don't impact Latinx students any differently than they impact non-Latinx students in terms of high school readiness. And again, since they're less likely to be suspended, um, it's not necessarily an area for huge follow-up, it's an area for follow-up district-wide for all of our students as suspensions have a, a truly negative impact on um, high school readiness, math six placement, and as we'll see later, graduation in A through G. <clears throat> so let's look at high school. So high school is the first time we start to see a little bit of a change in the attendance pattern, right? So. Our Latinx students are still less likely to be suspended in high school than their non-Latinx peers. However, they are more likely to fall in a uh, at risk, a moderate or severely chronic attendance band. So something's happening between middle school and high school that's impacting the attendance of our Latinx students. And um, that's an area where we can do a little more digging and, and we can have schools work with their own students to start finding out why are they not coming to school when they've probably been coming to school pretty consistently with their peers, K-8. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we're going to start doing in the research office is breaking this down and seeing, is there a grade level where this happens? This is aggregated 9 through 12 data at the moment, but we really want to break it down and look at, do we see it happen in ninth grade or does it happen later, 10th grade, 11th grade? Because again, that gives us an idea of where we can work with families and work with our students to try and head this off and, and keep our students coming to school where we know they can do the best learning. When you look at grad and A through G, you'll start to see that, that for our higher attendance bands, the, the gap in graduation rate is pretty negligible. There is a gap in A through G rate. Um, again, like I said, that gap has closed since 2011 and is continuing to close. Um, so, so this looks better every year and we're working uh, continually to close this gap for, for all of our subgroups. But again, you'll notice that as we move down the attendance, students with poor attendance or students who have been uh, suspended are less likely to graduate and they're less likely to be A through G. And it happens for all students. Um, it really isn't an over impact on, on the Latinx subgroup compared to their peers. The gap stays relatively similar. Um, it gets a little bigger as you get into moderate and severe. So again, that idea of for the students who are, are truly having attendance problems, which is more likely in high school, um, then they're more likely to have graduation uh, issues. So we have to create an intervention for them. And then here's that same data slide for suspensions. So you see students with no suspensions versus one or two or more suspensions. And um, the gap widens a little bit. So it does look like suspension is slightly more impactful on our Latinx students in high school in terms of graduation rate. Um, again, remembering that Latinx students are slightly less likely to be suspended. So you're not getting the double, the double compounded effect like you are in some subgroups who are more likely to be suspended and suspensions more negatively impact their ability to graduate. Um, same with A through G. Uh, in fact, you'll notice that the, the difference between one suspension and no suspensions is huge for everybody in the completion of A through G. I mean, the, the rate drops from 66% to 19%. Um, so the gap actually doesn't grow, it shrinks, but that's not the kind of gap shrinkage we're looking for in terms of everyone falling, right? Um, so really that, that impact of a suspension on A through G is something that, that we can look uh, student-wide or system-wide because um, it's impacting all of our subgroups of kids. It's not overly impacting Latinx students. And then the other thing we did just to kind of look at different is we tried to look at is there a combination? So is there where suspension and attendance come together and is that having a more or less impact on our Hispanic students? And it's interesting when you look at A through G, um, obviously the biggest gap is in kids who have never been suspended, 
and have strong attendance. That's the biggest gap. So the kids who are not in trouble and the kids who are at school all the time is where we have the, the most work to do in closing the A through G gap, um, which is a positive thing because those are the students who are at school. Those are the students we can interact with. We can find them for interventions uh, and, and we can do that academically. When you see both chronic and having suspended at down at five and 6% for Latinx and non-Latinx students, you see that the, the impact of students who are suspended and don't come to school um, for whatever reason is an area we gotta work on for everybody. For graduation, it's slightly different. Um, for graduation, you see that the one or the other bar seems to be uh, an issue where students with poor attendance or who are suspended graduated about an 82% rate, but our Latinx students in that category only graduated about a 74% rate. So that's an area where if we have a student who's got either poor attendance or a suspension, or and then the bottom bar, both cases, um, you know, intervene early, especially if we see that kind of a pattern in ninth grade to intervene early and, and help make sure we keep that student on track to graduate and we provide the support that that student needs. So these are just ideas to give us um, beginning places for our sites to start looking for students, a beginning to start to understand the impacts of certain things um, to make sure we're not making assumptions that we know about exactly how any one attendance or suspension or GPA might be impacting a student's post-secondary success or options. Uh, and like I said, for, for our Latinx students, uh, the vast majority of our students have, have done a great job. They're, they're working hard, they're learning more than they ever have by all the traditional metrics, um, and they've closed the gap in a lot of categories. So really positive news, but you know we do have some things to work on. So, and with that, uh, any questions about our Latinx student progress data? I can't see your hands, so give me start stop the screen share here. There we go. Okay, so do we have any questions? Dr. Benitez. Thank you, uh, Chris. And, and I realized that we would have had much more time uh, in a board workshop, so I'll, I'll try to limit my questions here. But I think um, it's important to note, uh, Chris, that we did have an increase in overall enrollment of self-identified Latinx students to 58%. Um, so I think it would also, with that in mind, uh, be good if we could look at our Latinx students since they represent more than half of our overall enrollments in comparison to the other subgroups, uh, not just as reference points, but because I think data-wise, if Latinx students do well, disproportionately well, then it improves because they're the largest percentage of our students, our overall district numbers by the same logic and rationale in those areas where Latinx students are not doing uh, as well as we would like, they disproportionately impact our overall uh, district numbers. So I think um, for future reference, it would be good for us to look not just, uh, although I appreciate it, Hispanic versus non-Hispanic or Latinx versus non-Latinx, or Latino versus non-Latino, but in comparison to the other subgroups, because we do make up uh, the largest percentage of the students. So with that in mind, Chris, I guess two, two, two areas of questions. Um, one is it's super interesting that we have growth and improvement in A through G completion, um, in high school readiness, um, in um, number of students taking AP classes, but at the same time, um, I think the data slide showed that we have a 9% decrease in our Latinx ninth grade students uh, doing better than 50 percentile on our PSAT. So it's interesting to juxtapose that ninth, something happens either at the ninth grade or after the ninth grade as students start taking AP classes. Could you speak to that, uh, Chris? Sure, it's, it's the uh, 11th grade, right? So our ninth grade students was a 9% increase in yeah. students above the 50th percentile. The 11th grade is a 9% decrease. Okay, yes. You have to, a couple of things. So one, that's 50th percentile nationally. So um, A through G completion is grade-based, whereas the PSAT is a nationally given test. So, so you could have motivation factors for students who are or are not interested by the time they get to 11th grade and thinking that the PSAT has an impact on them. You also remember that's 50th percentile is a comparison not to themselves, but it's a comparison nationwide. So what it is could be indicating, I won't say is indicating, what it could be indicating is that that while we are seeing growth, it's not as fast as growth nationwide between ninth and 11th grade 
And so that therefore you're seeing them not stay over that 50th percentile because again, that's a national percentile range. Yeah. Um, so it's not that there's no growth, it's just that maybe the growth isn't as fast as we would like um, for, for a variety of reasons. A through G has, has many more indicators that go with it, um, many more grades, many more interactions with the teacher as opposed to a one-time test. And so I think it speaks to the ability for us to interact with students and keep them successful on those multiple interactions as opposed to a one-time high stakes test. Yeah, that, that's, that's good to, to keep note of. I think the other area of questions for me, Chris, are um, sort of the elementary school experience moving into uh, sort of two areas. One is uh, who ends up in accelerated math in the sixth grade. And then the second uh, for me is, uh, I think it's also important to highlight and note because a large percentage of our EL elementary school children are ELs, uh, sort of how we disaggregate our EL data, given that a large percentage of those ELs are Latinx, uh, right? So when we start having conversations about our long-term uh, ELs five years or more, presuming that they've had those five years in our elementary schools, again, all of that sort of intertwined. So love to get your thoughts on sort of what, you know, how, how do students end up in uh, accelerated sixth grade math or not? So uh, I have two responses, I guess, that I'll, I'll give. One is that the, the uh, EL data set is the next data set that I will hopefully be pulling as we go through this series of looking at our baselines and where we were sort of the last nine years pre-COVID. As far as students ending up in Math 6 Accelerated, I would defer to my colleagues. Um, I don't know if Dr. Lund or Mr. Moskowitz want to jump in here at all and, and provide some context for that. Yeah, there's several criteria used for that Math 6 placement, uh, one of which is SPEC scores. So looking at student scores from fourth and fifth grade, any student that has met or exceeded in either grade gets automatically placed to Math 6 Accelerated. If you are GATE or Excel identified, it, identified, you're also automatically placed in Math 6 Accelerated. In addition, any student that is meeting in all the core subjects on their report card coming out of elementary school. So on that fifth grade achievement report, if you are scoring a three or higher in the core subjects, reading, writing, and math, you are also recommended for Math 6 Accelerated. In addition, we have a couple of school sites that have actually even expanded that even further and have offered it to all of their students. So this year we have nine schools, in fact, that all their students in sixth grade are in Math 6 Accelerated, um, including several schools where the percentage wasn't close to, you know, wasn't above 80 or 90%. So you have wait, well, a couple of schools that are piloting some projects of pushing all their students into Math 6 Accelerated and supporting them in the program. So offering a Math 6 Accelerated Development course in addition to the Math 6 Accelerated course to provide that additional support. So our percentages um, therefore have greatly increased knowing that this is the gateway to algebra um, in middle school. I really appreciate that, Dr. Ludd, and, and that's where I was headed with it, right? If, if, sixth, if sixth grade accelerated math is a good uh, predictor and notion of where students will end up once they say start, start taking that A through G, then it's not just about, you know, I'm not, I know you're not saying that, but it's not just about tracking students into math accelerated, but providing them support, right? Because ultimately that is a good, we, we do have a good sense, fortunately, and in some cases, unfortunately, where students end up if they're in math accelerated in the sixth grade or not. So I appreciate the connection there, Dr. Lund. I'll pause there because I, I, I don't want to hog up the time with my colleagues. I have just one more question after, but, but I want to uh, share the time here. Okay, do we have uh, questions from other board members? Dr. Benitez, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so um, regarding GPA, I'm sorry, regarding high school readiness, high school readiness. So um, my presumption here is based on the data, and we've, we've had several presentations on uh, where we're at with high school readiness. Uh, there's a close connection between attendance and high school readiness. Can you talk a little bit about what are those indicators that our district is using as high school readiness indicators? Because I, 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 I understood that attendance was an indicator uh, for high school readiness. So how do we juxtapose that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
generally speaking, we have a high school readiness index and attendance is an indicator. For the slides I showed you today, we pulled attendance out since we were comparing it to attendance. It would be uh, very skewing to leave attendance as an indicator inside something at current tent. Um, but it's generally uh, high school readiness to, to meet high school readiness is it's attendance rate over 96%. It's no suspensions. It's a GPA in middle school of 2.5 or greater with no Ds or Fs. That's the the indicator for high school readiness across and then for meeting or not meeting it. Again, when we did our comparison here for this slide, uh, we pulled attendance out of that and looked at the suspensions, GPA, um, and Ds and Fs. And then when we did it for suspensions, we left attendance in but pulled suspensions right, out of the calculation. Right. So I had to ask, uh, Chris, you know, you know I had to ask. That, that's uh, Following that logic, then I'm, I'm curious, and, and this is open to not just you, Chris, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll invite anyone that wants to speak to this. Uh, given that our students under 2.0, that's one of the challenges that we have. And given that chronic absenteeism, uh, so all of these things are sort of intertwined with, with um, high school readiness. Where are we putting sort of our energy and thoughts? Uh, because there's obviously all of these things are intertwined and interconnected. But where is that sweet spot, uh, so to speak? And, and again, it's not just to you, uh, Chris, in terms of where we're putting our energy, energies with interventions in those critical years that we know are middle school uh, in this case. Since there is, again, such a close relationship with attendance or chronic absenteeism, um, the other high school readiness indicators that you're looking at, and yet that, that percentage of students that fall below a 2.0 at some point uh, I think there's a direct uh, correlation uh, there. So any thoughts? Uh, not to put everyone on the spot here. Dr. Camarino, you're looking down. I guess you don't want to answer that one. <laughs> I will uh, defer to the Dr. Lund and Dr. Camarino, Mr. Moskovitz on this one. I don't mind starting off. Um, looking at our at-risk students, you know, Part of it is just the shift from middle school to high school in terms of the impact of grades um, on your course completion. You know, the tracking of credits in high school, whereas we don't track it in middle school. Um, so part of it is, is an education of students in terms of the impact that their grades have on graduation and A to G stepping into the high school setting. Part of it is identification of those at-risk students coming out of middle school. So the high school counselors come down and meet with all of the uh, eighth grade students and identify students that are at risk coming out of middle school. Um, and uh, Dr. Camarino can talk further about this, but really do uh, some outreach efforts to really monitor and track the progress of their most at-risk students coming into the high school. So not waiting for them to fail in high school, but knowing that these are at-risk students coming out of middle school based on their middle school grades. Um, so part of it is education around the grad and ADG requirements and the impact of grades, um, the impact that assignments have. We're especially feeling that now in an online environment where we do have a larger number of missing assignments, which is producing a larger number of students with Ds and Fs. Um, so that is gonna have an impact moving forward. Um, but part of it is obviously paying attention to the data, intervening and supporting students with that um, while they're still in middle school uh, so that they start to understand the impact that their grades have on future performance. Yeah, and I could piggyback on that a little bit and just basically really the part that we were, we're finding is the SEL component of students believing in themselves, right? That's the biggest piece. So at the high school level, we're looking at the success, success rate of our students, not just GPA, but also who's taking AP classes, where our students are coming from neighborhood wise. We do a plot diagram of where our students are coming from at each of our schools, what middle schools they've had uh, as far as their, their experiences. But again, the biggest factor that we want to feed into is that whole mindset of them believing in themselves. And I think that's the number one key is if we make those connections with our students from elementary, middle, they'll be more successful in high school. And that's the part that really is the work that we're doing around our U6 work uh, with, in the district with giving all the work that we've been doing post uh, pre-pandemic of really helping our students understand that they have to, the belief the belief that they have in themselves to be successful because we know we have pathways that require GPAs. We have certain AP classes that students take. So a lot of these things to them feel foreign and, uh, and high stakes where families who know 
to get into X school or X pathway, you have to have, you know, algebra in the eighth grade. A lot of our families don't know that. So if we don't have that mindset into them from elementary school to believe in themselves, to strive for taking those challenging courses, it has to start from not just at home, but at school from elementary on to push themselves to go into this. So those are some of the really, the hard work that we're doing as a system to calibrate the work, to have that common vocabulary of motivating our students, no matter what their situation is, uh, uh, where, what neighborhood they live in, what middle school they came from, to really strive to work, to take those high end, high stress, high, whatever you want to call them, class, academic classes for them to feel successful. And also again, to Dr. Lund's point, the, the importance of grades and not falling behind early on when they first get into our system. Because we know that once we have our ninth and 10th graders pass, not be credit deficient in ninth and 10th grade, the success rate of them graduating is, is extremely high. We just have to get, catch those ninth and 10th grade students prior to them falling behind or falling, uh, falling into uh, credit deficiency. And Dr. Yeah. Benitez, I just wanna just add one thing to it. And that's where the support of student support services comes to play as well, uh, working collaboratively with the level offices and their staff as far as working with parents early. So the, the huge goal around chronic absenteeism and attendance is tapping into our early childhood um, parents, our Head Start parents, our CDC, um, our educator parents just to discuss the importance of attendance and how that plays um, as far as academic achievement and outcomes. And that's one way that we've been working very closely together to work with those parents early. So as our students matriculate through the system, right, they'll, they'll understand, they'll be educated, they'll be informed, um, they'll understand how the system works and the importance of having those grades to move into, right, those top tier classes as my colleagues were, were speaking of. Yeah, two pieces I would add to that would be the expanded opportunities for students in middle school to be in an accelerated program. So we've made it a concerted effort this year to put more students into an accelerated program because they're more likely then to take an AP course when they go into high school. They've been in an accelerated course and they're more, they're just better, better uh, prepared to, and in their mindset in particular, to take an AP course. In addition to that, it's really that explicit teaching of some of those SEL skills. So we know in our, our SEL data, our students have a, a higher perception of self-efficacy, the belief that they can earn an A, the belief that they can, the belief that they can manage difficult assignments in, coming out of fifth grade than they do coming out of eighth grade. So there's a, a steady decrease there that we need to address. So we need to work on our students' ability to you know, believe, in their, believe in themselves and give them the skills to tackle those difficult assignments and earn an A in a class. Um, and believe that their effort makes a difference. In addition to that, especially in an online environment, just that self the self-management skills of ma managing your time, managing your resources, managing your assignments um, is crucial. So it comes down to how do we teach students these skills instead of relying on those innate skills that they bring to us. I really appreciate everyone's candid perspectives. And, and in some ways we're talking about a, a uh, Yoso's community cultural wealth model. Uh, right, that these skills, these talents, the belief in themselves and what they're bringing uh, to our school settings are, are important, and valid, and directly relate to again self-efficacy uh, and 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 the desire, uh, right, to to apply uh, that knowledge in these uh, different contexts. Um, Ms. Curry, did you have a question or comment? I did. Uh, Dr. Simon actually jumped in and, and answered what I wanted to. I know part of uh, the workshop was going to talk about the supports um, that student support services provide in addition to the level offices, in addition to individual school sites and counselors, especially around that chronic absenteeism and how that is a plan that we have, as she said, from very early on, because of this data specifically, we know the importance of it. So uh, thank you, Dr. Simon, for jumping in to uh, address the thing that I wanted folks to hear is that it isn't just reliant on a teacher reaching out to a student or a principal or a counselor, that there is a system outside of the schools that works diligently on attendance um, and those chronic absentee kids and their families to make sure they have the resources to get their kids to class. So thanks. I just want to add to that while this you've heard some really important aspects of this work, including the data. 
all of this is on a foundation of high quality teaching in every classroom. And so while you didn't hear a couple of the departments talk about their work, um, every single person in our district has something to do with the results that we're experiencing. And, and there's a lot on what we call good first teaching or high quality instruction. Everything is, um, has that as its foundation. Um, Mr. Meyer, did you have a question? Yes, I wanted to add, you know, in this, let's not forget about the affective domain. When kids leave a middle school and go to a high school, they're leaving a smaller, more personal environment and going into a huge campus, which is virtually a small city. And it's very difficult for a lot of those kids con to connect in a meaningful way with an adult on a high school campus. I would hearken back to the old days when we had a home room. And for three years in those days in a high school, you would report with the same group of kids to the same teacher for three years. That teacher in effect became a counselor to those kids as well as the counseling staff. So the work that, we, that you all do with data is phenomenal and I applaud you for that. But somewhere, you know, let's get back to the idea that it's the human being in the classroom, the adult, the teacher, and his or her connection with the students that make the most difference. Mr. Meyer, just to build on that, I think that's where the equity work that uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Baker are leading, uh, because unfortunately not all of our students, and we know which ones, are as comfortable uh, in these settings and are uh, you know, building of themselves high expectations. And so I think that's where, again, the equity lens to all uh, that we do uh, sort of spearheads uh, that because we, we clearly know which students from which backgrounds are more comfortable in those settings and are doing well in the classes. And in this case, 58% of our students now, is, is that up 4% from last year? I thought we were up 54 or 55 last year. Uh, it, whatever that is, that, that, um, that's a significant majority of our students now that may not have those effective um, perspectives uh, that you just shared, uh, Mr. Meyer. So just building on that point. I agree. Thank you very much, Juan. I would just add that the parents need to be included also when we're speaking of the education as far as um, the importance that the middle, middle school grades have, that type of thing. It's keeping the parents in the loop and educating the parents as well. And respectfully, I'd like to add and just end with the work that our high schools are doing with the pathway work and having the school within a school model and the connections of our pathway ambassadors from link crew of, a, you know, having our ninth graders come on board feeling like, hey, hey, welcome to high school and pathway ambassadors and role models to help them through link crew has really helped and having parent nights as you mentioned, uh, Madam President, it's just an amazing piece that our, hi our high schools are working really hard and that concept of school within a school, having the same groups of students follow the same path of teachers and having the same admin and counselor for their four years is really making a difference. Thank you. All good things. Thank you, everyone. So Dr. Lund's gonna take off from here and go into a presentation that he planned after an analysis of K-8 schools program model with some, some guiding questions in mind and then some analysis that he's gonna share with you all. Again, building on our look at student outcomes and thinking about our, our programs for students that we were expecting to be able to present in the board workshop. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, I'd like to first build on what Dr. Cam Camerino shared in terms of our middle school programs, including our K-8 schools and being that bridge between elementary and high school. And really, what does that look like in terms of the coursework that we offer, the accelerated courses preparing students for accelerated honors and AP courses in, in high school, the elective offerings in terms of helping students know which pathway to choose because they've had a course that introduced them to that to that pathway. Um, as as a way of really uh, bridging the elementary experience and the high school experience. So I know. Uh, Chris Itson, if you don't mind pulling up to that, that presentation. First, uh, before I begin, let me just thank uh, Ms. Rankin for her uh, candid and thoughtful and exceptional presentation. Very well done. And thank, thank you, Chris Brown, for your uh, presentation on our Latinx students. So 
This presentation is really a big picture overview. It's an information item um, with the intent of bringing you an action item at our next meeting. Um, with these guiding questions in mind, of looking one at the history and enrollment patterns of our K-8 schools, looking at the impact of school of residence versus and school of choice on enrollment, the long-term trends in student achievement, in particular of our middle school students at our K-8 schools, the elective options, as I referenced in terms of supporting students with uh, choosing pathway options in high school. And then finally, some short and long-term considerations for our K-8 programs uh, and looking at what, what we can address moving forward with our K-8 schools. We currently have eight K-8 schools and you see them spread throughout our district here. You see four schools on the west side or downtown part of Long Beach with Hudson, Robinson, Meir, and Powell. And then four schools on the east side with Tincher, Coverly, Newcomb, and Gompers. The next slide shows the history of our K-8 schools. We have one school that was a K-8 school for the longest time, and that was Newcomb. Uh, starting in the 1960s, Newcomb opened as a K-8 school with the El Dorado Estates Project. And it was our only K-8 school for the longest time uh, until the early 90s. In the early 90s, you see some schools that expanded to K-8 schools and two schools that opened up as K-8 schools. So Powell and Robinson opened up as K-8 schools and the remaining five schools expanded to K-8 schools for a variety of reasons noted here. It's important to note also that we had five additional K-8 schools that are no longer K-8s. Henry uh, was a K-8 school. And when we opened up Keller, Henry became, um, went back to an elementary school. Sutter, which was uh, for, at the Dooley site, essentially, when Dooley and Lindsay opened, um, that's when Sutter disappeared and we had two separate schools. Bircham was a K-8 school that transitioned back to a K-5 school, similar to Henry. And then we've had two K-8 schools that have closed, both Monroe and Butler. On the next slide, you see the enrollment history of the past six years. Powell was our largest K-8 school for the longest time, almost 1,400 students at one point and is now our second largest K-8 school with Mir being our largest. Our smallest K-8 schools are Gompers and Hudson and they have long been our smallest schools. You see two schools that have kind of leveled out in their enrollment, Tincher and Newcomb um, that are no longer on a steady decline. Whereas most of the rest of our schools are at a steady decreasing enrollment over the years. The next slide breaks down the enrollment based on level. And this is important to note, just that the majority of, of our K-8 schools are actually elementary students. That's not surprising when you think about the fact that K-8s have six grades that are elementary grades. And if you include TK, actually seven, uh, and then three grades that are middle school grades. So you see essentially that the majority of our schools are anywhere from 58 to 78% elementary schools. Now, fortunately, uh, you know, Dr. Camerino, previous to me, and then in my position being a former elementary principal and my director, uh, Dr. Cecilia Camerino was a former elementary principal. We're obviously in a position to support the elementary side of our K-8 schools, um, but it is a consideration that these schools are essentially elementary schools with pretty small middle schools. Um, the next slide really focuses on the middle school enrollment. And you can see how small really some of our K-8, um, the middle school portions of our K-8 schools are. Hudson and Mir being our smallest uh, with just really around 200 middle school students, uh, followed by Gompers. Our largest is Coverly with almost 400 middle school students. You see, we do have some SDC programs in middle school um, in most of our K-8 schools with the exception of Powell and Robinson. Powell has an elementary program, but not a middle school program. On the next slide is building on that enrollment of breaking it down by grade level. So at the smaller sites, um, at Hudson, for example, Mir, you see very little, very small uh, enrollment essentially moving through those grade levels where 
you know, 60 to 70 students in sixth, seventh and eighth grade, which essentially is two sections for each of the core subjects. And what I mean by that is basically two sections of English, two sections of math, history, science. Most of our schools have a slightly larger um, enrollment with three sections of each. And then Coverly, once again, being the largest with four sections of each. On the next slide, you see really the capacity of these sites based on that, the number of sections available. So we do have a large number of openings at both Coverly and Gompers, and then relatively few openings um, at several of our sites, including Mir, Powell, and Robinson. This year was pretty exceptional as it relates to reaching capacity just because of the different programs that we were offering uh, in anticipation of students returning in a face-to-face -face model versus those that were staying online versus those that were choosing in an independent study. So that did in fact impact our ability to actually reach capacity in some of our sites. The next slide uh, looks at school of residence. And what you see highlighted, here you have a list of all of our middle and K-8 schools and the number of students that live in each of the residential boundaries of each of the schools. Obviously you see at our large middle schools at Franklin and Washington, the large number of students that live in those residential boundaries that is not indicative of the enrollment at those schools. So Franklin has 1500 students, but roughly has an enrollment of about 1200 right now. Washington, 1400 li live in the uh, Washington boundary area and their enrollment is under a thousand this year. You see the highlighted K-8 schools and you can see that we have a small number of students that live within the K-8 boundaries. It's important to know that two of our schools don't have a residential boundary for middle school. And that is Mir and Gompers, meaning that Mir fifth graders essentially are assigned to Stevens as their resident school and Gompers fifth graders are assigned to Bancroft as their resident school. And it's been that way since they were opened, partly because uh, Mir's middle school program can't accommodate the large number of students. Um, and historically Gompers couldn't either. Uh, so that was really why they were opened up essentially as school of choice programs only for middle school. Our two lowest schools with in terms of resident counts are Hudson with just 137 middle school students living within the Hudson boundary and Tincture with 157. Our largest, as you can see there, is uh, Coverly and Newcomb, if I remember correctly. Here are the percent of students that actually um, attend the schools and how many of them are resident students. So at the low end, just 35% of Tincture students in middle school are resident students. And then at the high end, uh, Robinson, 75% of Robinson's middle school students are resident students. And then like you see there, uh, two of the sites don't have a resident boundary and therefore don't have resident students. The next slide looks at school of choice and how many of our students choose our K-8 programs versus our middle school programs. So 9% of our fifth graders are, live within a resident boundary of a K-8 school, but 14% choose a K-8 school. In six of the eight of the schools, space permits all the fifth graders who choose to attend to stay at their school if they choose. Uh, in two of the sites, only a portion of the students can attend just based on enrollment. And that is Mir with 50% and then Powell with roughly 75%, meaning that their sixth grade can accommodate 75% of their fifth grade. Now, with that said, roughly all the students that from Powell that choose to continue at Powell generally can do so because there's enough students that choose other programs outside of Powell. Mir, by contrast, is not that way. Mir generally over um, has more students interested in their middle school program and therefore has to rely on the school of choice uh, deferred process to actually identify students for their middle school program. Here are the number of students that actually expressed interest in the various K-8 programs. So at the high end, Newcomb is the most sought after K-8 program with 301 students coming out of fifth grade choosing Newcomb as either their first, second, or third grade or, or third choice, followed by Tincture and Coverly. Uh, and then at the low end, you see uh, just 137 at Gompers, 146 at Powell, 172 at Hudson. 
So we have some K-8 programs that are highly competitive within the school of choice process, and then some that are, are less competitive. The next slides uh, look at continuity of the program, and then we're gonna look at achievement. Here are the percent of students that actually stay within a K-8 program from kinder through eighth grade. So these are the percent of eighth graders who actually started at that particular school in kindergarten. So at the high end, MIR, 66% of their current eighth graders were with them in kindergarten. And then at the low end, just 22% of Gompers students in eighth grade were with them in kindergarten. So when we think about the K-8 experience of how many students actually spend nine years in a K-8 program, you see there's a wide range there uh, in terms of get, being able to leverage perhaps that continuity of instructional program, continuity of relationships, continuity of uh, family support and intervention. The next two slides look at achievement in both ELA. And it's important to note that I've pulled out here just the middle school students within each of these programs over the past five years of data around SBAC achievement. And this is capturing the, essentially the five-year change in achievement that you see here. And I gave uh, the middle schools as a reference point here as to say students, you know, that choose to attend a K-8 program versus those that choose a middle school program. And you can see we have some highly competitive K-8 programs that have had exceptional uh, achievement gains over the past five years and others that have had less gains. And then likewise in math on the next slide, um, you see the exact same five years of data. Once again, some exceptional gains in select K-8 schools. And then once again, some schools that have had less gains by comparison to the other K-8s and by comparison to middle schools as a whole. The next slide looks at elective offerings. So part of that preparation for high school is that exposure to electives. Electives fall into two categories. They fall into intervention categories, CCR, math development, writing, ELD, and they fall into enrichment opportunities. That could be music programs, art programs, dance, technology, project lead the way courses. So part of making that high school selection into a pathway is really having some exposure to that industry, or at least one course to know that, am I interested in multimedia? Am I interested in uh, coding as a course? Am I interested in a medical pathway? And how would I know that? So we have a couple of schools here that use an alternate schedule in order to provide additional elective options. So the simple one here would be a seven period day. So Tincture is one K-8 school that has a seven period day. In addition, we have two middle schools, Keller and Marshall that have a seven period day. When you have seven periods, all students have two elective options instead of one. So therefore you end up with additional elective options because of that. In addition, our, we have several K-8 schools that run creative schedules using an alternating day schedule broadly defined as a circle triangle sort of schedule, uh, meaning that they alternate their electives, giving students additional elective options. So the average middle school offers 21 electives, and you can see here how our K-8s approximate or, or fall short of that elective op opportunities, depending on the model that they run. And once again, this is important just to approximate that preparation for high school, and how do we do so? So some of the implications for that, or the reasons behind that, um, K-8 schools generally are more expensive to run. They're more expensive to run because of the lower ratio that we generally need to keep in a K-8 model. And this is because of the one limited amount of, of core offerings that you're able to provide within a K-8 program. When there's only two courses per subject, it makes it very limiting in terms of maximizing uh, course load and maximizing elective options. So generally our K-8s fall at a lower student to teacher, teacher ratio than our middle schools. In addition, you have credentialing restraints, meaning that many K-8 middle school teachers have to be credentialed in multiple subjects because of the limited course offerings. So instead of being able to offer a full English course load or a full math course load, you might have certain teachers that teach a couple of courses in math, but might have to 
fill the gap with three courses of PE. So you'll have some credentialing challenges that um, impact the K-8s more so than the middle schools. Uh, and like I said, that has an impact on elective offerings. The implication here is really our K-8 schools are more expensive to run. Roughly about, we spend about an additional half million dollars because of the lower ratio. Uh, we generally offer fewer electives in our K-8 schools, including fewer music sections. In most of our middle schools, you're able to offer a pure music section of beginning intermediate and advanced band and beginning intermediate and advanced orchestra. In our K-8 schools, we generally have to combine those courses, either by level or across, or across orchestra and band. And then finally, we, we have more teachers that are teaching on their conference periods in K-8 schools than in, we do in middle school. And that's just, once again, to accommodate the additional electives, perhaps to accommodate the, uh, the course, course sections. All of our teachers at MIR, for example, are teaching on their conference period because we have six sections and teachers teach five generally as part of their caseload. So to reach that sixth section, basically all MIR's teachers agree to teach on their conference period. So these are just some of the implications of our programs in our K-8. So some of our considerations as it relates to this is some elementary support and looking at how do we provide additional technical and pedagogical support for the elementary parts of our K-8s. So knowing that our middle school meetings tend to focus more on middle school structures, middle school programs, how do we provide that additional support to our middle school principals, counselors, uh, in terms of elementary programs, elementary pedagogy, elementary supports. The second is really how do we provide that, that additional elective offerings at our K-8 schools to approximate what our middle schools offer. So knowing the role that electives play for both intervention and for preparation for high school selection, how do we provide that additional elective offerings across all of our K-8 schools? Do we look at that uh, alternate schedule and, and look at how do we uh, systematize perhaps that schedule across our K-8 schools? And then finally, looking at the enrollment trends, the level of interest based on school of choice, the achievement trends, the cost implications and program options, looking at the potential conversion of select K-8 schools to elementary schools, similar to what we've done with other K-8 schools, similar to what we did with, with Henry and what we did with, um, with Bircham. And that is time bound. So part of our recommendations moving forward and part of the action for our next board meeting will be an exploration of certain recommendations on modification of programs prior to our school of choice process opening up in late January, early February. So this was really an intent to give you a broad overview of our K-8 models prior to those rec recommended action items that we look at at our next board meeting. So I'll open it up to any questions. I applaud the work that you've done, Chris. That's phenomenal. Um, the restriction of elective classes does concern me, particularly when you uh, incorporate pathways. And I'm impressed that, for example, a student that likes to pursue music is a little bit short-changed when he or she has to uh, both abide by a pathway and then the restrictive uh, scheduling that takes place in a K-8 school. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. And I will say that, you know, our music teachers do an amazing job trying to accommodate just some of those restrictions. Um, and some of them, you know, I think of the mu exceptional music program at Coverly and the number of students that she serves and really that flexible uh, way by which she has to accommodate the different uh, levels of students. And doing so often in a, a standard elementary classroom. Um, so you don't have the large spaces that you have at the middle school. Um, so you often have to do so in a, in a pretty small space. And it's, I'm always amazed when I go into those uh, K-8 music programs, how we've really, uh, and this is obviously prior to pandemic, really uh, crammed a large number of students into a very small space to be able to provide that program. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I also appreciate the work. I think that is something I've heard consistently from from teachers over the years. 
um, on my time on the board is their concern at the limited number of options for electives. And that for some students, we know that art and music are uh, what bring them joy. It's what inspires. We know there's a correlation between music and math for sure. Um, and so I've had K-8 teachers really talk about that concern because they see a need and a desire in their students, but just not the opportunity. So uh, interesting and important information. Thank you for uh, the research. I had no idea that um, the history of why they were other than I just assumed it was the enrollment boom of the 90s for all of them. Okay, Dr. Benitez. Dr. Lund, it's, it's, uh, it, it's amazing how you put all of that into one uh, presentation. And I'm trying to wrap my head around, I guess one, one big thing that, that falls into two buckets. Um, the challenges that come with the K-8 model vis-a-vis -vis the challenges that we have with school of choice given the geograph the geographies, right? So if you look at, uh, I don't remember the order, but it was Newcomb, Tincher, Coverley. I don't remember in what order uh, with the higher enrollments, but also um, our students with disabilities and the programming and services that they get, for instance, at Coverley, uh, right? Which is a model uh, for us. So if just from a 30,000 foot high level, Dr. Lund, um, how would you sort of evaluate and assess the school of choice challenges that you very clearly uh, pointed out? And it's not just limited to our K-8, right? We have, we have that challenge with our elementary schools and, and certain neighborhood schools, um, you know, with, with the stigma that comes with those neighborhood schools, the preference of, of, of parents from a perception uh, really basis uh, wanting to go to other schools. I, I, I'm trying to separate those two lines. How, how do you see those, Dr. Lund, those, those two? Well, I appreciate your question. Uh, it does reveal the complexity of the school of choice process. Um, our K-8s, because in many of them, they do have the space available to accommodate additional students, they do become a default option for some families that perhaps don't get other options. Um, so if they're middle school of choice, um, let's say for example, Marshall, which is a highly sought after school is not accessible to them just because of the large number of applicants to that particular program. Many of them consider our K-8 schools as an alternative to that program. So our K-8s do provide that, that option, if you will, um, in a, a smaller setting. So that would probably be the other incentive of looking at you know, parents that are concerned about a larger middle school setting um, and looking at the K-8 model as a way of mitigating that concern. Um, the challenge always becomes one of transportation to our various K-8 programs. So you might have the space. So you saw the large number of spaces that were available at Gompers, for example, but it's also um, geographically challenging for many families to get to because of its location. Um, so that's probably just one, once again, a mitigating factor as it relates to the school of choice process. Um, and, you know, looking to see what we can do as a system to support families with that, to provide those multiple options. Um, but knowing that transportation is always one of those challenges that families confront. Chris, question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, some of the difficulty involving electives and the student's ability to, to, to take elective courses. Uh, and if, if, if we talk about the music program, and I'm talking in particular about the Harmony Project and what that project has been able to do in opening up opportunities for students to be involved in music, does that program compensate for the lack of opportunities, uh, let's say for students to overall enrollment in elective courses, does that, does that program help in that situation? It doesn't necessarily um, impact our K-8s as much. Most of our, well, our Harmony project is uh, centered at Washington and Stevens right now. So most students do filter into a traditional middle school program, um, partly because of the more robust offerings that you can, you can provide at a middle school um, in relation to a music program. 
Um, I would say the, all of our schools offer music right now. And I think that's important. So it's, it's part of our structure. What our K-8 uh, music teachers have in addition to their middle school responsibility is the support of their elementary program is instead of being able to offer five sections of music for their middle school, two of their sections basically support their elementary program. Mm. So their three through five instrumental program um, gets supported by those same teachers. So that's really where that impact um, you know, lies in terms of you know, just having fewer sections to offer um, at the middle school, at the middle school part of the K-8. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Lund, this might be a conversation that we talk about more when you bring um, recommendations or staff brings recommendations to our next meeting, but you did touch on it briefly, so I want to talk about it. We know that we have some students who uh, survive, thrive better, um, prefer smaller environments. We know we have students that are attracted to our smaller high schools um, for the very reason that they are smaller high schools and they feel more comfortable. So if we're looking at um, potentially creating just elementary schools, I assume that those students would then go to our existing middle schools, which some are bigger than our small high schools. And so I, I just wanna bring the conversation point that we do have some students that would prefer a smaller middle school option. Um, we know that we have students that leave the district over that because they prefer a smaller middle school option. So in the conversations that we have about what this looks like moving forward, I would hope that we continue to have to talk about those students as well. And that just as there is a need for those smaller high schools uh, for students who just prefer being around fewer students that we're looking at that as an option for our middle school students as well, because some of those same anxieties around the switching of classes and and um, feeling overwhelmed by big environments. Some of our middle schools are 14, 1500 kids. Uh, so I'd ask that we continue to, to think about those students and families as well as we move forward with options and choices. Yes, I appreciate um, that perspective. Our middle schools are decreasing in enrollment, just like our elementary schools. So our larger, we do still have some larger middle schools, um, but we also have a large number of middle schools that are under six, 700 at this point. Uh, so much smaller middle schools than we've had historically. I would say yeah, it's balancing that school of choice option with also programs, program options, you know, so how do you offer the best of a middle school creatively within a K-8? And like I said, some of that alternative scheduling that schools have used really helps mitigate that challenge of being able to offer additional electives, while at the same time hoping that students that choose to stay in a K-8 um, are also achieving at the same level. Um, and are you know, so that's an important part of the equation too, is that if I choose to stay in a K-8, hopefully it's with the expectation that I'm making at least the same amount of progress that I would have made had I gone to a middle school. Well, do we have any further questions or comments? No, in that case, thank you very much. Um, very comprehensive presentations and um, very interesting information to pour over. Um, so we will move on now to business items. Uh, personnel, Dr. Williams. Yes, Madam Chair. I have the personnel report uh, prepared by our assistant superintendent of HR, uh, David Zay, and approved by uh, our superintendent, Dr. Jill Baker. I'll read the classified portion of the report first. There were 25 appointments, eight leaves of absence, one termination of service, two resignations, four retirements, and one amendment. On the certificated portion, there were 10 appointments, three leaves of absence, and four retirements. And I move approval. Second. Discussion? Um, all in favor by roll call vote, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. And I vote aye. Opposed abstentions passes 5-0. Um, board authorization. Move approval. 
Second. Discussion? Yes, Dr. Yes, Bates. Madam Chair, could we just um, get a quick explanation about uh, what these are and why we're doing it at this time and uh, the large number of, of um, teachers that we need to authorize just process mice? Yes. Um, who would like to address that question? Uh, Dr. Baker. Mr. Zaid, would you like to speak to that item? Sure. Can you um, restate that one one more time, Dr. Benitez, your yeah. question? Mr. Zaid, I think it would just, just uh, so community members know uh, what we're talking about here in terms of single subject uh, credentials and why we have to go through this process of authorizing folks teaching um, in a subject not of which they receive their credential and the additional units that need to be taken for them to be considered. Um, sure. So um, each year, this is something that's standard as it relates to board authorizations. Um, sometimes it includes uh, electives and teachers who have a credential in a different area. Um, the majority also include coaching positions. When we have someone who is coaching that does not have a physical education um, credential. And so the board authorizations allow uh, these teachers to teach in those areas. As a part of this, they review their transcripts to look at the courses that they've taken through their credentialing and bachelor's program to ensure that they have competency in the area that they are uh, instructing in. But, but we are taking, um, it's two separate actions. One, one is the coaching and one, one is the, the teachers, right? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Zaid. Okay, are there any further questions? In that case, all in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed, abstentions, passes 5-0. Coaching assignments. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed, abstentions, passes 5 0. Finance report A. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed, abstentions, passes 5-0. Finance report B. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, I recuse myself from participation in finance report B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees. Any further discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Um, opposed, one abstention that passes 4-0 with one abstention. Business department report. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions passes 5 0. Purchasing and contracts report. Move approval. Second. Discussion. All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. And I vote aye. Opposed, abstentions passes 5 0. Uh, we move to superintendent items. Um, we have none. 
unfinished business, we have none. Uh, approve additional members to the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Well, Ms. Kerr, I don't know, I think you were going to say something, but uh, if I could. Sure. <laughs> I just want to thank those members who are stepping up to serve on this committee. Hopefully I have the names correctly or pronounce them correctly. Um, Vianney Gomez, Leticia Ar Arbesia, and Joey Hayashi. So thank you for stepping up and serving. This is a wonderful uh, committee. Did you want to add something? No? <laughs> okay. It's so, it's so tough when we're, um, you know, trying to do this over Zoom. Um, anyhow, any further discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0. Um, equity policy development update. Uh, Dr. Brown, do you have any uh, updates for us tonight? No, I don't this evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, and we look forward to uh, your next update. I know that this is um, very interesting to a lot of people. A lot of people are paying attention, and rightfully so. Um, report. Uh, I have uh, just a quick question for Tiffany. Tiffany, um, I've encountered about three or four people in the community that have stated that they've applied to be on the uh, part of the equity uh, task force and uh, very, very interested in serving. I did share with them your comments about being able to keep everybody in the loop, even though you can only accommodate so many members, but it was very encouraging to hear all of that coming in from folks out in public who are really geared up about doing this work. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The response has really been um, not only overwhelming, but really compelling and speaks to the expectations that our community has right now about their participation in our work. And so I'm looking forward to the report next meeting, which will be on December 15th, to really roll out the next steps for how we will incorporate as many of those interested people as possible in the work we're doing ahead. So thank you very much for bringing that forward. Thank you. Um, so we will go to report of board members. Mr. Meyer. Uh, I have none, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll make this as quick as possible. First and foremost, I wanted to just share my appreciation and thank uh, Dr. Sidney Young uh, for those wonderful words of support from Album. And it's really been a blessing to work with Album all these years and I'm really gonna miss the interactions with them. And thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Dr. Young. Also, I wanted to report very quickly, uh, we have a guest, had a guest speaker today. Uh, her name is Dr. Makita Robinson and she addressed the Female Leadership Academy in the district today. But uh, she is a grad of Long Beach Unified School District uh, by way of uh, Mini Gantz, Hughes Middle School in Poly. And she also attended uh, Long Beach City College while she was a student in the district. She went on to uh, receive her undergraduate degree uh, from John Hopkins University. Uh, she has an MD, PhD, physician scientist, and a graduate of Stanford University School of Medicine. Her mom is none other than, Dr. than Doris Robinson. So I just wanted to just comment and give her some, some prompts. The other is uh, about uh, Roberta Jenkins, who most of you know, 
Roberta was just uh, uh, informed that she will receive an honorary doctorate from Claremont Graduate University, my alma mater. And I'll just read the letter very quickly. Dear Mrs. Jenkins, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, and the entire Claremont Graduate University community, it is with great pleasure that I invite you to receive an honorary doctoral degree at the university's 94th commencement ceremony on Saturday, May 15th. Each year, members of the CGU community nominate honorary degree recipients who have distinguished themselves through their dedication to inspire our graduates and improve the broader community, as well as their stature as role models for future generations. We have chosen to celebrate you because you exemplify these qualities. Through many years of service on the School of Education Studies Board of Advisors, you have shaped policy and informed the thinking of deans, faculty, and students. Through the foundation that you and your late husband, Matthew, established, you have empowered the aspirations of countless students at Claremont Graduate University, Tuskegee University, Charles Drew University, UCLA, and Cal State Long Beach. Every life that they touch has been guided by your hand. Through your spirit of volunteerism with many community organizations, you have supported and inspired young people to pursue the arts and STEM fields. It is for these reasons and more that we ask you to accept an honorary doctoral degree and with it, the distinction and accolades that it confers. I do hope you will accept this invitation. Please feel free to write to me, uh, Lynn Jessup, or to my executive assistant with your decision. I very much look forward to your re response. Signed, Dr. Lee Je Lee J Lynn Jessup, President, Claremont University. Let me just finish up with, uh, with this. And thinking about what both her and her husband have contributed to all of these schools and this, the feel of being able to serve students Contributions have been long and involved, as some mentioned in that letter, and in terms of her service. But the fi financial contributions have been many and varied to include the uh, countless students over a long period of time, to include the math collaborative. She continues to this day to provide scholarships to math collaborative students. And the math collaborative program is near and dear to her heart as it is my own. Uh, the results of the programs have been impressive with nearly perfect graduation rates for African American students at Jordan High School. The college attendance from colleges through, and universities throughout the United States has been exemplary. And those students who have gone through the math collaborative have come back to serve as mentors to their, to the, to the current students. Um, what we've seen advance since that point is the math collaborative uh, at Cabrillo and Wilson High School. These are uh, models of the Cabrillo, uh, of the Jordan program, but with the twist of being multi-ethnic. I anticipate similar results in terms of the academic outcomes uh, beginning to, and beginning to witness threads of this already. Also important to note, uh, the potential for uh, the de-escalation of ethnic group conflicts as a result of the programs. These programs serve as an excellent example of foundation for equity among students of color. And uh, we see the impact of the math collaborative, and in my opinion, in the years that I've spent in the district, that is the one standout program that has done much to move the academic needle for students of color, and in particular, African-American students. And it should serve as a model point for equity in our district. Uh, I want to make a request of Tiffany that as we move forward uh, to uh, give us a status report on all the math collaborative programs to include the following criteria where it applies to graduation rates, school attendance, A through G completion, passing rates in math, English, college attendance, and also the program reporting lines for these programs. 
And to Roberta, the recognition by Claremont is well deserved and your lifelong dedication to students and in particular students in the math collaborative is deeply appreciated. Last but not least, I will be sharing information with our incoming board member, Eric Miller, and updating him as well on this program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Kerr. No report tonight, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Benitez. I'll keep my report very short, Madam Chair. Just want to um, recognize all the volunteers and different community organizations that um, came together in the last couple of weeks to do um, turkey dinner distributions, food distributions for so many families across um, our city. Um, in, in my region, I wanna give a particular shout out to groups like AOC7, uh, Long Beach Forward, uh, just hundreds of volunteers that in the last two weeks uh, were able to provide uh, food for um, some of our neediest families in this part of town. So thank you. I know I'm leaving out some groups, but just want to give props to everyone that did so much uh, to make everyone's lives a little bit uh, more comfortable and better uh, this last week. Uh, also want to um, thank the uh, Kamai students and parents and teachers at Whittier. Uh, they've been doing really cool uh, stuff at Whittier Elementary School. So big shout out to the teachers and parents and, and students um, still advancing uh, our cultural languages like uh, Kamai and our cultural heritage. And um, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Well, there are uh, precious few student activities to report on these days, but I received word from our Lakewood Navy JROTC Captain McMacken regarding their final inspection report. And the actual inspection was completed at Lakewood High School on uh, March 12th, earlier this year. Felt, it felt really weird to be at um, at an event on March 12th and then March 13th, we made the decision that schools needed to be closed. Um, anyhow, uh, the Lakewood Navy JROTC was rated outstanding, the highest possible rating, so well done. And now we will be spending the last part of our meeting honoring our two retiring board members. Dr. Baker, did you wanna set this up? I'm just gonna cue Mr. Itson, we are ready. It's almost incomprehensible for us to imagine the Lone Beach Unified School District without Dr. Felton Williams and Mr. John Meyer, who have spent over 30 years combined making a significant impact in our community as members of the board. The LBUSD is deeply indebted to Dr. Williams and Mr. John Meyer, and we will miss them dearly. I know you all join me in wishing both gentlemen well as they embark on a new chapter in their lives and thanking them for their service to the Long Beach Unified School District. We are the district we are today in large part because of all they have done for student staff and the community at large. Thank you. Dr. Williams, it's been an honor to serve not only as a principal with you, but on exec staff on all the hard work and commitment you've given and provided for our students here in the Long Beach Unified School District. I've had the honor to be with you on several occasions, to sit with you at dinner, to sit with you uh, during different site visits and get to know all the work that you've done, not just in your career here in Long Beach, but your whole career uh, growing up and all the struggles and all the commitment and everything that you've done to put, work, put forward for all of us in order to make things better for our students. Thank you. Dr. Williams, congratulations. Um, I cannot believe this is actually happening, but I'm so happy for you and I wish you the best. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and working with you all these years. Um, I do hope you stay in touch and I wish you the best in life. Thank you. Dr. Williams, today we are celebrating you. 
Your advocacy for students of color has left a legacy for us to build on for years to come. I have learned so much from your relentless focus on finding, developing, and nurturing programs that uplift our most at promise students. Thank you for your extensive service to LBUSD and the Long Beach community. It's great to know that you'll be nearby leading the efforts to build an African-American cultural center and to ensuring that our students have the resources they need to succeed. Your legacy of good work will continue to resonate with us for years to come. Congratulations and best wishes. Dr. Williams, thank you for a lifetime of dedication to other people. You have been such a supporter of so many people in the Long Beach community, really with students first and in what you do and in who you've been, you've shown that your connection is to students first. We are appreciative of you. We have learned from you. And in recent months, as we've had the opportunity through you to learn more about you and your life and some of the struggles and adversity that you've worked through, it's only created more admiration for how we feel about you. So thank you so very much for being a great model for all of us. We look forward to crossing paths with you. We hope that you won't be a stranger to us and we know that you'll be out there supporting the efforts that we're making on behalf of our 69,000 students. Take good care of yourself. Dr. Williams, I'd like to congratulate you on this momentous occasion. You have been a rock for this board for more than 16 years. I can't thank you enough for always putting equity first in this district, not only for students, but for staff as well. You've been my personal champion and I will be eternally grateful for your support of me as a female in leadership. You will be missed greatly. Dr. Williams, I wanted to wish you a very healthy and happy retirement. I wanted to thank you for all of your years of service to our district and for your uncompromising commitment to all student success, uh, but particularly our most vulnerable students. Thank you for your service and for um, all the efforts uh, that you've made uh, to advance your district uh, in the best ways possible. So take care and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your service to our community and to our school district. Your laser-like focus on equity and ensuring that no student is left behind by our system has left a lasting impression on our work. You've inspired us to challenge, to innovate, and forge ahead for what is fair and for what is just. We are so grateful for everything that you've given to us. Thank you. I wanna thank you for being a mentor for me. I wanna thank you for being a guiding light for me. I wanna thank you for always being in the forefront, for me knowing that no matter what was happening, you were always working behind the scenes, advocating for the very best. I wanna thank you that you have always insisted on equity for all students. And I wanna thank you for your years of dedication. I know that you're not going far and I know that I will continue to see you, but I wanna thank you for being a mentor for all the times that I've met with you here in the district and all the times I've met with you outside of the district. I wanna thank you for encouraging me to pursue my doctorate. I wanna thank you for making calls on my behalf to look for the best programs. I wanna thank you for all the small ways that people don't know about, that you work tirelessly to ensure that we have the best here. I wanna tell you that I am proud of you. I'm proud to know you. I'm proud to have been mentored by you. And I'm proud to continue your legacy here in Long Beach Unified School District. I know that you're not far. I know I have your home phone and your cell phone, and I'm looking forward to talking to you real soon. Thank you again. Felton, I really appreciate all of your support in our district over these years. You were working in, in equity before we ever called it equity. You've helped to connect our district to other districts around the country through your work on the Council of Great City Schools. You've really set the example for others to follow and just so appreciative of everything you've offered and provided to our district, thank you. Dr. Williams, congratulations on your tenure here at Long Beach Unified School District. 
You had a career in higher ed before you joined us at the K-12 level, and your insights have been valuable throughout your 16 years. Congratulations and best wishes for the future. Dr. Williams, your legacy on the board will be long lasting. Our work with, with equity is grounded in your years of advocacy and demand for the historically marginalized students in our system. It was a pleasure to collaborate with you on so many projects over the years. Thank you for serving our district and representing us so well on the national stage. Dr. Williams, it's been an honor to work with you over the last 16 years. It's been exciting and to grow up as a leader under your guidance, and I wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you for your years of service and dedication to Long Beach Unified School District. So at our last board meeting, Felton talked about having to run a campaign. And it was at one of these campaign fundraisers I attended that I saw Felton singing in public for the first time. And I was impressed. I was surprised. I didn't know he had that hidden talent, but I was impressed. I mean, Felton, don't quit your day job, but you're pretty good. I'm going to miss you too because you have brought such dedication and knowledge and experience. You, you truly will be missed. So thank you for everything you've done. Congratulations, Dr. Williams, on your retirement. I just want to thank you for being such a great board member. As principal at Burnett Elementary, now Smith, you were my board um, member for my for the area. So I just want to say thank you for all your support throughout your many years, but also for your um, for the way that you are so supportive of our Long Beach Education Foundation. I just want to wish you the best. Thank you and enjoy your retirement. Dr. Williams, thank you for your 16 years of service on the Board of Education of the Long Beach Unified School District. Your commitment to equity, eliminating and closing opportunity and achievement gaps, and ensuring that all students are college and career ready when they graduate have brought national recognition to our school system. In fact, you were invited by President Obama to go to the White House because of your efforts and the efforts of your colleagues here in the school system. The impact that you have had on this school district will serve our students well for generations to come. I can't thank you enough for being a positive role model for me a mentor, great boss, and most importantly, friend. I wish you the best in the next chapter of your life. Dr. Williams, I wanted to take a moment to thank you for your tireless efforts in supporting the students, teachers, and staff of Long Beach Unified for these many years. Your strength and consistency in advocating for the needs of all students has been a major part of the long-term success and growth that LBUSD has experienced. Now, personally, I will always remember hearing about your passion for Long Beach students and your visions for LBUSD as we traveled together a decade ago, learning to expand our high school pathways. Thank you again for giving so much of your time and effort to our school district and our community. Wow, that was very, very special um, and deeply appreciated. Uh, just thank you one and all. It sounds like you're speechless, Dr. Williams. Well, I have a right to be, thank you. Very appreciative of everyone, the opportunity to work with so many good folks over the years. Uh, yeah, it's very special. So Diana, my office is already cleaned out, so, you know, help yourself. But, well, you do have one more meeting. Let's not forget that. Thank you one and all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you thank me. you. Okay, I think we have something else. Mr. Itson? It's almost incomprehensible for us to imagine the Long Beach Unified School District without Dr. Felton Williams and Mr. John Meyer, who have spent over 30 years combined making a significant impact in our community 
as members of the board. The LBUSD is deeply indebted to Dr. Williams and Mr. John Meyer, and we will miss them dearly. I know you all join me in wishing both gentlemen well as they embark on a new chapter in their lives and thanking them for their service to the Long Beach Unified School District. We are the district we are today in large part because of all they have done for student staff and the community at large. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, thank you so much for your many years of service to the Long Beach Unified Community in service to our students, our staff, our families, our administrators. You have been in service to everyone for a very long time. And in what you do and who you are and how you carry yourself, you show value for everyone and everybody who's had the chance to work with you or connect with you or talk with you feels the value that you demonstrate for all of our students. We wish you love and happiness and health in your next chapter. We're going to miss you tremendously around here, but we'll be looking forward to seeing you when our paths cross and we know that you're going to be out there continuing to be a champion for Long Beach Unified. Take good care of yourself, enjoy your time with your family and let them enjoy you. Mr. Meyer, today we are celebrating you. You are the consummate professional and ultimate encourager. My earliest memories of you were visiting your school when you were a principal and I was an aspiring teacher. Your passion for education was evident and inspired me to pursue education with my full heart. Your legacy runs deep and wide in LBUSD. While we'll miss seeing you regularly for LBUSD events, we know that you will be our number one cheerleader in the community. Thank you for inspiring us and leading us and for decades of service to LBUSD. Hey, John, I cannot believe the day has come. I am so happy for you and your family. I wish you the best. Um, I will certainly miss you a lot. And it has been a pleasure getting to know you, working with you, and I always appreciate your kindness towards me. Um, please stay in touch and we will see you soon. Coach Meyer, there is so much love and respect for the legacy that you have left from a teacher to coach, administrator and board member. I hope that we continue to make you proud. As a coach, you led a football team of leaders in our system that became my coaches and leaders in my system. And I hope that I can make all of you proud, the legacy that you have left. Thank you is not enough to say thank you for everything you've done. I'm gonna miss you. I'll probably see you at the barber shop. <laughs> to see you around town, but more importantly, coach, I want to support the work that you've done in ensuring that some of the night events that we go to, I'm the first one to lead everyone out. Thank you. John, congratulations. You have been an inspiration to us all with your incredible work ethic. Your leadership legacy in my eyes will be so much more than all the work that you've done, but it will be about your kindness. Every board meeting, you thanked and recognized the teachers and administrators for their hard work. And those words of gratitude and encouragement really helped fuel us for the next challenge. Those words also let us know just how much we mattered to you and to the students of the district. So thank you, John, for your constant support and know that you will be greatly missed. Mr. Meyer. I wanted to congratulate you on your retirement and say thank you for your over six decades of service to our district as a teacher, as a coach, as a principal, and uh, now for over uh, 16 years as a school board member. So thank you for your unwavering commitment to our student success and for all of your years of service um, to our district and to assuring the success of all the students. So. Wish you very well in your retirement. I know you're still gonna keep busy, uh, but take care and stay safe. Mr. Meyer, I just want you to know how much I admire you and admire your leadership. From your strong voice in our board meeting, to your advocacy, to the way in which you always place students at the center of all decisions that are being made. 
from a distance, I want you to know that I admire you. I appreciate the opportunities I've had to spend with you going over some of the personnel reports. I want to thank you for being a um, pillar in our community and for all that you do uh, for your area. You have been influential not only at Avalon and not, not only at some of our high schools, but all throughout and your leadership will not be forgotten. Thank you for contributing to Long Beach Unified School District. John, I can't thank you enough for all the years of service you provided to our district. You have such steady leadership, your eloquence. Anytime you speak, you're like E.F. Hutton. When you speak, people listen. I really just appreciate uh, at each of our meetings, your unwavering support for our teachers, for our staff, for our administrators. You will truly be missed. Thanks, John. Mr. Meyer, congratulations on your tenure as board member here in Long Beach Unified School District. We know that everything happens through relationship here. And I've said for a very long time that all relationship roads lead back to John Meyer in some way, shape or form. So I wanna thank you for the impact you have had on our community, on our students and on our families here in our greater Long Beach community. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, your dedication and commitment to our district is beyond compare. Throughout your time on the board, you have demonstrated why you were held in such high regard as a principal and coach. You are a kind-hearted man of integrity, gracious and sincere in your compliments, bringing a smile and joy to all around you. You will be missed. Mr. Meyer, it's been wonderful to get to know you over the years you've been on the board. I've always appreciated your candor, your honesty, and it's been a pleasure to be able to get to learn from you especially your years as principal that I've learned from. And thank you for your service and good luck in your retirement. I love that John has such deep roots in Long Beach that the Myers are four generations of Long Beach Unified students, teachers, coaches, principals. And in fact, one of my favorite tidbits is that John was Chris Steinhauser's football coach at Wilson High School in the 1970s. I just love that part. Um, John, you always have just the right thing to say. You always have a witty little phrase or story. And I think that's what I'm gonna miss most. So good luck in everything you do. Hello, Mr. Myers. John, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you for being such an outstanding board member. While I was principal at Alvarado, you were always so present and you were always willing and supporting of our work at Alvarado Elementary School. So thank you for that. I also wanna thank you for your welcoming ways as I transitioned into the board building as a director. Thank you for always having that smile and I just wanna wish you lots of luck in your retirement. Mr. Meyer, thank you for your 17 years of service on the Board of Education for the Long Beach Unified School District. Your commitment to equity, eliminating and closing opportunity and achievement gaps and ensuring that all students are college and career ready when they graduate from high school have brought national recognition to our school system. Your commitment to excellence for all students will ensure that for generations to come, the youth of this community will be well served. I've been blessed to, to know you since I was 15 years old. You have been a positive role model in my life for all these years. You've been a great mentor, coach, boss, and most importantly, a friend. I wish you the best in the next chapter of your life. Thank you so much. Coach Meyer, thank you for always pushing the district to strive for excellence and to be leaders and innovators in the world of education. Your leadership and vision have always challenged LBUSD to look for solutions that meet the needs of our students as well as of our teachers. Your firsthand experience with every level of the system gave you the wisdom to ask deep questions of our work and to provide strong guidance for the vision moving forward. You have left a lasting legacy in the district and the community, and I wish you relaxation and fulfillment in your retirement. Thank you, Mr. Meyer, for so many years of caring and commitment to our school district. You've seen this district through its triumphs and its challenges, always keeping student achievement and student well-being as your central focus. We've so appreciated your honest words, your perspective, 
and unbridled optimism for the future of our school district. We hope you take great pride in the legacy that you leave. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Meyer. <laughs> well, thank you one and all for the most gracious, gracious words. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I might have to borrow Felton's handkerchief if, if it is not too soppy at this point. But anyway, I have nothing but gratitude and thanks for what all of you have done for our kids. Every one of you, uh, I will cherish forever. What the district has given to me, I can never repay. It's it's just been a, a, it's just been a tumult of joy, and and pride in what this district has done and what it will continue to do. So, thank you, one and all, once again for your most gracious words. Well, thank you, thank you. I think those videos, uh, you know say it all with how much you you are appreciated both you and dr williams and just a little bit of the impact that you've made on people and and this district and it certainly feels good and just to let you know what that impact has been so thank you again okay it's hard to move on but um superintendent's report? Great. Well, the only thing that could be um, compared to talking about John and Felton are is talking about our students. So I will end just with a couple of things. First, um, some commentary about our students and then just one announcement. First of all, I'd like to recognize that Korea has stayed on for the entire meeting tonight and we are so grateful for that. We know that students can't always do that, but we see you, Korea, and we are so grateful that you are that you are there with us for the that you have been with us for the entire board meeting. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Second of all, Dr. Kale and I had the honor this after, or this morning of participating in a meeting of the California Collaborative which is something that our district has par participated in for several years, but today featured a panel of students, um, those who came from the cities of Fresno and San Jose and Long Beach Unified School District. They participated as members of Californians for Justice in a panel that was facilitated by the executive director, Tara Nishida. And we can be so proud of Megan Lane and Eliana Walls, both Poly High School students who represented our district and represented themselves just beautifully on the panel. They spoke about issues of race and racism. They spoke about the experience of living through a pandemic and, and learning at a distance and all of the challenges that that have, has. And they just spoke so eloquently and so appreciatively of teachers who have connected with them and those in our district and in the city who have helped them through this difficult time. And I just thought you'd love hearing how Megan Lane summed things up as Tara Nishida called on her to um, say some closing comments. She said, as students, we are the experts of our own stories. And she couldn't have said more strongly why we work so hard to bring student voice and why we're working harder than ever to bring student voice into our decision making processes into committees into other places of our work where students have not yet held a, a seat at the table, so to speak, but Megan really summed it up so beautifully. You might remember Megan's name because she's also the co facilitator the co student facilitator of the student the superintendent student advisory committee. And so much to come about her. We're lucky that she's a junior. So we have another year after this of her leadership in our district, but they just did such an excellent job. And then lastly, an announcement to community members that this Saturday, there will be a virtual community education forum that partners a number of community agencies and partners from the city. Um, around our city agencies and then our school district. We'll have a number of executive staff making presentations and a really rich opportunity to interact with members of our community around issues of going to school and, and um, 
being a parent during a pandemic. And so I invite you, if you wanna look on our website, you can find that information off of the front page. The Zoom link can be found by clicking on the Community Education Forum link that is under more headlines on our front district webpage. And that forum will be held from 10 to 12.30 this Saturday. And we invite all of you to that. That's my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, do we have any other announcements? Yes, Dr. Benitez. Just one brief announcement, Madam President. Um, Drake Park is having a food drive to provide a holiday meal for families this month. If anyone's interested in finding out information or uh, possibly making a contribution, 562-528-2076. They'll be collecting food between now and the 15th. Thank you. Um, any other announcements? I just wanted to thank Dr. Baker for talking about the forum this Saturday. It's also the link and the flyer are found on all of the social media accounts. Our marketing and media services have done a great job pushing that out on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So you can look for the information there as well. Um, and just a reminder to be really good to each other and kind to each other. Things are very, very tough right now uh, for a lot of families and a lot of folks in our community. Um, so stay, stay, stay safe and take care of yourself and take care of each other. Um, that's a very good note to end on this evening. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and good night.